Good morning. Welcome to Twin Cities Christian Church. We're glad you're here. If you have your Bible, it's turning to Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. We're going to be doing an overview of Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17, as we read, if you're following along. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath and in the waters below. You shall not bow down and worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter nor your manservant or maidservant nor your animals nor the aliens within your gates. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or his maidservant, his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Over the past several months, we have been inundated with lots of new rules to follow. Rules from the government, rules from stores, uh, lots of things to remember and keep track of. And I've noticed as I've watched the people as they have gone through this and as they've tried to follow these rules, they're beginning to grow a little numb to them. And here's what I mean. Um, In the stores that we've been to, there are the rules for the aisles where people are supposed to go down the down aisle, up the up aisle. And I've noticed things like this, rules like these, people begin are beginning not really to follow. Initially, early on, people tried to pay attention, it seemed like, but people have kind of grown weary, and they kind of started doing their own thing. And they just kind of, by nature, they tend to let some of the rules slide, when to wear a mask, when not to wear a mask, um, offering six feet of distance, all of these things, people begin to make up their own rules, and they begin to make up their own way that they're going to follow the law or the things that are put forth. And this is the same thing uh, that happens in some ways as we honor God as we're called to do what God has called us to do in Scripture. And as followers of Christ, we must follow God's mandates in all the areas of our life. And as we explore the life of Moses, we see that the Ten Commandments that God has passed down uh, to him to share with the Israelites, and from them we can learn some lessons for our life as well. Um, There are some things that the Ten Commandments can teach us, and we're kind of going to do an overview of the Ten Commandments today. And we find that basically it's broken out into two sections. Um, The first section, the first thing the Ten Commandments teaches us is how to love God. Um, Turn back with me. um, Turn back with me to Exodus chapter 20. And I want want you to remember something that takes place right here. As God spoke all these words, he says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Then he begins and he goes on by telling them what to do. And as we begin Exodus 20, God issues a reminder to the Israelites who he is. And he reminds them that I am the God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. The freedom that they enjoyed didn't come from their own hands. They didn't earn it. They didn't work for it. They didn't figure it out by themselves. It came from the hand of God. God had saw their... uh, their suffering. He saw what they were enduring and what they were going through and provided them with freedom, provided sent Moses to go call them out of Egypt and free them from the hands of the evil Pharaoh. And as we begin, as we go through the first part of the Ten Commandments, verses 3 and 4, he says that he instructs the Israelites to not have any other gods or make any other idols for worship. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven, above or on the earth, beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. You see, for us in 2020, this seems funny that you'd have to tell somebody not to have another God or to have something else to worship. At first glance, at first blush, we think, well, why would you do that? I mean, we don't do that. We aren't setting up for the most part. Most people 
are not setting up idols in their house. Not that some people aren't, but overall, by and large, we don't see that very often. But we have to understand that Israel existed in a polytheistic, pagan world, meaning that they made up their own deities, meaning they served a lot of gods. They made up their own things, gods that they would worship. They would design things, craft things, and then they would bow down and worship them. Um, It would have been common practice for people to worship all sorts of gods in hopes of finding favor. But the point here, the point that God is making, is that God, Yahweh, the one true God, is the one we are called to worship. And that said, there's only the one, he's the only one that we are to bow to, the only one that we have worshipped to. He is the one that had called and saved the Israelites, called them out of slavery, and we are to worship him alone. You see, if we love God, we have to be devoted to him. Nothing else can take his place. The Ten Commandments goes on to say not to misuse the name of the Lord, often translated into taking the Lord's name in vain. And what's being referred to here is the making of the false reports by malicious witnesses. Um, if you look forward at Exodus, Exodus 23, this very thing was happening. It says, do not spread false reports. Do not help a wicked man by being a malicious witness. We should not bear witness. We should not... Um, be using God as this tool, as this thing to bear a false witness. We need to only say things that are true that honor God in this way. Um, Yahweh, our God, Israel's God, um, was revealing his presence to them. And the sharing of this name symbolized that he was dwelling with them. And to disrespect or abuse it meant a separation from that relationship. We couldn't misuse the name of God. We can't misuse that um, say things on behalf of God that didn't come from him, use his name in vain, um, in, in any kind of a slanderous way. We're called to use his name in the proper way. This is the one true God that we worship that loves us and had called out the Israelites out of slavery. The whole idea of loving God first is not wavered and putting him first and using it right. It, Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. If you want to turn with me there, Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. Jesus talks about this. This is what was taking place. Uh, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? This is the Pharisees and Sadducees asking Jesus this question. Who, what was the greatest commandment? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbors yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. One of the experts of law of the law was trying to, they were kind of trying to trick Jesus by having him point out what the greatest commandment is. And he said, no, this is what it is. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your soul. And love your neighbors yourself. These are the two things that we're supposed to be doing. The first was love God. Love him alone. The world in which we live in all these years later is still dealing with the same struggles that plagued Moses in Moses' time. And we see this play out in a variety of ways. First, we see people attempt to mix a modern philosophy with, uh, with what God has given to us in Scripture. We see that people attempt to mix all these things together and kind of come up with their own law, their own rule. We see... People worship God on Sundays, but then begin to look into things like astrology and begin to look into things uh, like having uh, spiritualist medians and trying to contact the dead and things of that nature. I've heard this happen a variety of times amongst people that are calling themselves Christians. And I'm here to tell you these two things are incongruent. They don't mix. They don't go with one another. You can't have both. You have to worship the one true God and serve him alone. It reminds us of this reminds me of the scripture in Acts 4.12. If you want to turn with me there, Acts 4.12, where salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. That name is Jesus. Our salvation is found through Jesus. We have the one true God, the one Savior, his Son, Jesus. And this is the only way to which we find life and we find hope. You see, we're not permitted to create our own truth. 
by mixing worldly things in with the one true God. We can't just meld all these things together and throw them all into the pot and mix them all up and decide this is what we believe. We don't get to create our own God. We don't get to, we don't get to create our own way of thinking. There's not, this is not the way this works. There's not just, uh, there's not just shades of gray. It's black, it's white, it's scripture. It's what God has called us to. Second, we can find ourselves making idols out of activities and things and putting them first in our life before God. And what I mean is this. We begin to shift our focus from them, from the one true God to the things of earth. Be it an activity that we're involved with, um, even if the activities are not bad in of themselves, be it something we're striving to buy or have bought. When we place these things above who God is, above God and seek them first, we can't ever have equal footing with God. God is seeking our time and talent and treasure. And if we invest in those things ahead of him, we're missing out. We have to decide what we love most and what we're dedicated to. We have to decide what it is that we are seeking. Finally, in the first section, he tells us to remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. And this is the first part of the, uh, this is the first, this day was a part of the divinely set order of things to bring a time of rest, blessing, and rejoicing between God and Israel. And while we don't have a specific command to remember the Sabbath in the New Testament, the same way Israel did, we do um, commit with one another. We worship together. And we are reminded the importance of this. Hebrews 10.25. The writer of Hebrews 10.25 drives this point home. As we're in this section, they're calling the people to persevere, the followers of Christ to persevere. And how we're doing that, part of it is, let's not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You see, we can't compromise this. We can't compromise meeting and worshiping together. We can't compromise following God um, as a group. It's important that we spend time to worship together. It's important that we spend time um, in praise and worship and digging into God's word together and fellowship. These are important things that have to happen. And Part of, part of the way we do that is we cut some things out, we spend some time, we pause for a minute, we take a break, and we focus on what's most important. We focus on God and putting him first. And we can look at what he has done and see all the things he's done in our lives. One of the more interesting things that has taken place in the midst of the pandemic and the closure of things is that it has required us to take pause, whether we want to or not. Our culture doesn't like to do this. We don't like to stop. We like to go from dawn till dusk, but hopefully this lesson we've gained from this time that we have, this pause and rest, has allowed us to connect with our Creator, because as His followers, we must place Him first in our life, and I hope that as things go back, we don't go back to shuffling the deck once again and putting other things first. I've heard stories of people gathering around computer screens and watching services together, worship with one another, and this is great. We need to continue to worship with one another, to encourage one another. This is something we need to continue to do. We need to continue to walk alongside one another and serve each other. We need to learn more from God and fellowship together. There's a second thing that we learn um, in Exodus. First, we learned about loving God, and that's the first place we learn. We learned the Ten Commandments teaches us how to love God. It also teaches us how to love others. It teaches us how to love other people. If we skip ahead to verse 12, it says, Honor your father and mother, so that you may live long in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. 13, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. As we enter the second part of chapter 20, the narrative shifts between loving God and loving each other. Um, this section begins with the is with, by telling the Israelites to honor your father and mother. Uh, the word is kabad, and in Hebrew it means more than to respect their wishes or being subject to them. It means that they're made a priority and that they're to be honored. And we're to show them honor in a way, to show them honor in our lives. We're supposed to honor our parents. And this is something we're called to do. We're called to do it not just as kids, but as we go forward in our life. We continue to honor our parents um, all throughout their life. The second thing that they point to is do not murder. It comes from the word lo terish, 
in Hebrew. And the basis for this lies in the fact that man is created in God's image. We don't want to murder or kill or harm what was made in God's image. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 so then God said, Let us make man in our image, and our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And this is man is created or uh, man is created in God's image, and we are called to honor God in this way and, and to treat others with kindness and love and respect. So Jesus takes it a step further further in the New Testament. He says, not only do not, the Bible says do not murder, but it says do not hate. And we're supposed to show kindness and love to each other and how we treat them and how we handle our relationships. Uh, following murder, um, they were commanded to not commit adultery, and the practice of which was a violation of God's purpose for marriage. Genesis 2.24 says, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. So as we're following God, we're called not to commit adultery as well. We're called to, to leave our father and mother and find that one spouse and be married to them. And that was the purpose. That was this bond of marriage. We're not supposed to have um, any kind of relations outside of this. This is how we're called to live and how to live with one another. He goes on to say you should not steal. And not only was this practice destructive and an impact on society, this was also a sin against God. Stealing something that didn't belong to you, taking things that were not yours. This is, continues to be a thing even all these years later. It continues to be something that people, uh, people still continue to do. We hear stories of it all the time on the news where people are taking things that do not belong to them. Then he goes on to say, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And that doesn't just include lying under oath, but just lying about people in general to other people. We should be honest in what we deal, now, how we deal with people. Now, oftentimes, uh, we talk about this and we think, well, the little white lies, the things that people do, um, and we begin to accept this. We begin to accept this as part of doing business, how we live in this world. Do we live in such a way that honors God um, by by uh, telling the truth and being forthright and being honest? Do we honor people in this way? See, we're called to be people of integrity, to be people of honor. The final two commands were not to cover your neighbor's spouse's possession. Um, this command went beyond a law code to a theological code. This was a moral principle. If you take these together, it's the first step toward the violation of the other commandments. So if you begin to covet things, be covet your neighbor's wife, be covet, covet a person, covet a thing, um, we begin to want something too much, it will cause us to slip in these other areas. It will cause us to, to shift our focus to where it doesn't belong. It will cause us to shift our focus to uh, possibly committing these other, uh, other sins as well. So we have to make sure that we are not coveting things that do not belong to us. We're not trying to take things that are not ours. And that we focus on what we have and be grateful and thankful for what God has given us. As we look at these commands as a society, we've taken considerable liberty with them. We begin to view what's black and white in Scripture and see it with shades of gray. Uh, from a humanistic perspective, we can begin to rationalize and make justification for making our choices. Um, we can say, well, you know, we were in love, and so it was okay, uh, this relationship. It was just a little white lie. It didn't hurt anybody. Um, the thing that I took was small. The business was big. They won't miss it. The point is, are we going to love and honor our neighbor and, in turn, God? We must not take liberty. We must not make exception or excuse. We must honor God, honor him, and try to adhere to what he has called us to do. Because, you see, as far as of Christ, we're called to a higher standard. We're called to a higher way of living. We're called to follow and live as Jesus did. First Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 15 kind of highlights this, this holiness, this holy living that's in our life. It says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Christ Jesus is revealed. 
As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Who is setting the standard in our life? You see, we don't get to make up our own absolutes. We don't get to make up our own truth. God has given us these for a reason. As we seek to love Him and seek to love others, He's called us to live according to His standard, found in Scripture, according to the way He has called us to live. We have to live according to the standard He has put forward because He is the leader. He is the one that has freed us and set us free from sin. He's given us His word to follow and to obey so that we can live a life that honors Him in all that we do. All through our lives, we encounter this idea of the standard that we live to. Um, when we're home, we have to live to our parents' standard to clean our room or do our homework. Uh, when we're on our own, when we get a job, um, we have to work to the boss's standard or the company's standard, even though we see people that don't live to that standard all the time. We have to make sure that we live to that standard and not seek our own personal level. In our lives with God, we have to make sure that we live in such a way that honors God's level, that we work in such a way that there's no new room for rules or interpretation. We pursue the standard that's found in Scripture, the standard that honors God. We want to make sure that we honor Him with our life. We want to give Him uh, all glory and honor in everything that we do and submit ourselves to Him in all ways. As we go through this week, let us think about how we can follow the standard that God has put forth in Scripture as we love God and we love others. Let us think that how we can obey and follow Him in all that we do. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the opportunity to dig into your word. Help us to learn from this message today that we do need to love God and we need to love others. And we've got the standard set before us in Scripture. Help us to follow it. Help us not to stray from it and help us to cling to it each and every day of our life. In Christ's name we pray.